we are a sm we are a small enough crowd here that um, if you feel comfortable just unmuting and and speaking up with a question or you know especially if it's a clarifying question or something's not making sense or you just want a little bit more extra information about a, a topic then then feel free to just jump in and interject that i, I i'm totally fine with that um let's see is uh at iowa valley rcnd is that is that jason claire who is that over there <laughs> Neither. Neither. <laughs> who's, uh, who's, sorry, say it. I, I was talking. Who is it? Yeah, no worries. Neither. It's it's Lisa. Lisa. Okay. Hi. Man. Hi. Yeah, we were it, just in that meeting last week. Right. Um, That's what I was just going to say. We, we, on Friday. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm I'm going to start out just by uh, before I share my screen. I'm just curious to hear. So the topic of this is cool season. Uh, vegetable crop production. Um, what specific, um, what specifically are you interested in in getting from this from this presentation? Obviously, I've put together a PowerPoint, but I want to be able to focus on the things that you specifically are interested in learning more about or want to chat more about. You can put it in the chat or feel free to unmute and say what it is that you're eager to hear about today. Hey, Dan, this is Brigham. Hey, Brigham. Um, I'm in Cass County and I um, manage a farmer's market and I also do some other local food work. We have a little program called Grow Another Row where we encourage folks to grow more food to share, um, mainly actually with our food pantries in the county, but uh, to address food insecurity. And I also talk with um, school food directors and whatnot. And there's just a lot of conversation about, well, how do we get local produce outside of the typical growing season? So. I'm here to just learn about like what are kind of what are the low hanging fruit opportunities here. Perfect. Thanks, Brigham. Susan, uh, I, I'm going to read something from the chat and then I'll, I'll get to you. Shelly says general information, the possibilities. Um, Susan, go ahead and then we'll, I'll read the next two chats. You can unmute, Susan. <clears throat> I'm Susan. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I'm from California and I lived in California for 17 years. And we grew our own year round there. And so I'm very interested in under, I mean, in the summer we have wonderful produce here um, in South Dakota. I'm in South Dakota, Brandon, South Dakota. But in the winter, it's just really weird to buy veggies from a box store. Like that just doesn't really compute. So right now, <clears throat> a third of my basement is uh, lettuce and peppers right now. And I have a massive aphid infestation. So I sprayed garlic and now my basement smells like garlic. And so I don't, I'm from California. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm trying to do something and any tips I could get on specifically like growing my own year round. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, I also spent uh, 18 years in California. Well, I grew up there, um, but now, and now I'm in Des Moines. So um I guess, I, and, I, and I've got some, I, I do have some things in my PowerPoint to, to share about that. Um, in the chat, uh, Laura says, never grown cold crops before, but I want to, I'm not sure how to start. Danell, thank you. I'm not 100% confident of planting dates so that things are timed correctly for winter, especially for greens banking for future harvest. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so I, um, in, in, and thank you all for sharing. Uh, if there's, uh, is there anything else before I move on? Hey, Dan, I guess I could chime in. Um, I am really, uh, so this will be my first year working with Grow Johnson County. Um, and I have kind of a horticulture background, um, but mainly with like native plants and herbs and not so much um, heavy on the veg production. Um, so I'm really curious about season extension specifically. And I have a friend who's growing leeks in his um, his high tunnel through the winter, and he does a seasonal. Um, I'm sorry, he does a weekly drop off, like veggie drop. Um, and why aren't more people growing leeks in the winter, or whatever we can be growing? Because, yeah, just like huge lack of fresh produce um, in the winter time in Iowa. So awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And Danelle says also maximizing the space and season for money. Um, uh, what offers more cuttings, efficient with space, et cetera, highest value crops. Excellent. Yep, I will definitely get into that. So uh, in putting this together, I, I, I focused, I think, too much on that word in, in when I was asked to speak on cool season produce. Um, and, I, I, and, and it sounds like y'all are interested in cold season produce, not just the cool season. And so I'm going to, I may skip over some of these uh, or go pretty light on some of my slides early on in the presentation that are about field production, because I've got a lot of meat uh, about, uh, about season extension extension and high tunnel growing and low tunnel growing in the tail end of this. Um, however, uh, I, I, I want to acknowledge, I don't want to skip too fast over it. Um, because the high tunnel stuff is a very, very much the same of uh, as what I gave at the PFI conference just a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, so I, it's I, I don't want to for and I know Danelle, you were in that presentation, weren't you? And and for anybody else who was, I don't want uh, to waste your time if there's any any good uh, you know pearls, if you will, in this in these other uh, slides. So um, without further ado, here here we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Here, you should be able to see my title slide there, cool season vegetable production. Is that what you, I see Lance nodding his head? Does that, that sound, that looks good? Okay, great. Um, I'm Dan Phileas and I approve this message. Um, I am an ISU extension and outreach field specialist for commercial vegetables and specialty crops. And before this, I was a far, vegetable farm manager for 14 years. Um, worked um, notably, I guess, at, uh, at a small farm just south of Des Moines called Middlebrook Farm, helped start that, get that thing off the ground. Before that, I was in Southeast Minnesota in, at Featherstone Farm, a large organic vegetable farm. And before that, at the Michigan State University Student Organic Farm. Um, Carmen, I see your, your thing, don't skip our field production. We, <laughs> I, 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 I will not. Um, and Michigan State Student Organic Farm before that. Um, and let's see. I clicked on Zoom so I couldn't advance. Great. So at Michigan State, I was there from 2010 through 2015. We had uh, field production and high tunnel production there. Our, our, our specialty there was year-round growing. So my experience with high tunnel growing and harvesting crops year-round came from Central Michigan, Lansing, Michigan area. We grew a little bit of everything there. Um, we had small plots and tunnels that we managed by hand and field production was done using tractors there. So um, it was it was a little bit of everything. We ran a farmer training program there. You can see several people in this picture who are who were um, training. They were people who had been in a career and had burnt out on it and wanted to get and learn how to farm, but they had no no uh, way to do that. So we, we hosted a farmer training program there um, that uh, that gave these folks the opportunity to learn for organic farming at the university. Um, a couple other things I didn't mention this in my talk at PFI, but our money that we spent there, we let's see. It might be on the next slide. Yeah. So whatever money we we earned there, that was all rolled back into funding the farm because we didn't get any, there was no funding that was coming in from the university. They let us have space at the um, horticulture farm to rent. Um, but, but all of our labor expenses and uh, fertilizer and seeds, all that stuff came from vegetable sales each year. And our gross sales at, the, at that farm were about $250,000 each year. Um, we had three 16-week CSA sessions, uh, 75 of the year round. And then with field production, we were able to add 75 more on each summer for 150 total. We had a farm stand that averaged about 750 a week. Not, not terribly hot, but um, it was uh, an educational experience for our um, for our students. And forgive me for saying not terribly hot. If, you know that that's a, a decent haul. That's an average over every week. Um, but I just know that there are some people, for instance, at the PFI conference, John Wasilius was uh, was saying that it's not worth his while if it's not three or four thousand, uh, you know, each week. Um, so that's, you know, if, if that's if you're in that situation, then then you would, I guess, uh, commiserate. But if you are not yet making 750, uh, it's it's not not a bad haul. Um, and then we also wholesaled to campus uh, to the our salad from our high tunnels was in the salad bar each uh, week throughout the winter. 
So this cool season, what I'm going to be focusing on throughout this whole thing, whether it's uh, in a high tunnel or outside, is this mid-September through mid-May time period when, uh, you know, there's that risk of frost uh, that could be happening. So these, these crops that are um, able to take that. And I've got a list of them here. Brassicas, lettuce, alliums, herbs, carrots, beets, chicories, spinach, and I, and what did I miss? I, I was going through it and I'm like, gosh, I, there's got to be something else. What else do people grow in the cool season? Feel, chime in on the, in the chat or pipe, pipe in verbally. Maybe I did get them all. Radish turnips. Thank you, Danelle. Yep. I, I was thinking that with, with brassicas, uh, but, but yes, the specific, there are so many brassicas. Radish, turnip, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage on and on and on, right? There's so many of these things that, 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 uh, that they, they are a huge part of any vegetable growers uh, um, stable, if you will. All right, um, this is a picture of our late brassica field at the Student Organic Farm. And this field production part right here is going to be the Student Organic Farm. There will be some slides in a bit from Featherstone Farm, but you can see the Brussels sprouts close up here and some uh, cauliflower beyond that and broccoli beyond that. Um, so like I said, we do did a lot of tunnel production, but the Field production was necessary for a bulk of the produce, and uh, we grew a second succession of tunnel crops outside um, the warm season crops. Ah, I'm not going to talk anymore about that because we're talking about cool season crops here. Um, but this production allowed us to double the number of shares. So this uh, this picture here is would be our early brassica field, which has our included also our carrots and beets and onions and garlic uh, in it, um, and our our spring cabbage and and broccoli. So that those things would be typically planted, oh, April 15th would be all of our onions and cabbages and carrots and, and beets. Carrots and beets might go later till May 1st. Um, the broccoli we'd plant on May 10th. We were um, concerned about button heading from frost, too many cold days. Um, we, and we thought that May 10th might help us avoid that with that plant date. Here's the early Carrots, beets, we did, you, you'll notice we did six rows of carrots in each bed there and four rows of beets. This was a hand managed space. We did not do any mechanical cultivation. If you were on the program last, uh, last week, you, you, you uh, will you can maybe understand that better that there's just not enough space to get a tractor through here. Or if you already are mechanically cultivating, it's uh, you need room to push that dirt. And we were using hose and things like that. And so a lot more hand managed uh, here. Um, our bed widths, Danelle, were um, six feet on center in the field. And um, yeah, yep, we had a single tractor, a, a John Deere 2155, 55 horsepower tractor um, that we managed this with. And it was all seeded with, uh, with an earthway. At, uh, Jangs had not been released at this time, or they had just hit the market. Um, more pictures from the field. All right, for field production in the spring, it was, um, we, would, we would cover crop as much as we could at that farm. And so we would either have spring sown, spring sown oats and peas. We would have uh, fall sown winter rye and vetch, or we would have fall sown oats uh, that would winter kill. And in the top picture here is a picture of some spring sown oats that are being just rot straight rototilled in. They uh, look to be about a foot, foot and a half tall and uh, maybe two feet tall. And, uh, the, and that those are just getting rototilled straight in with our, with our rototiller. In the bottom picture is a stand of winter rye that's later on after it started to boot up and, and that flower is just rising up through the, the middle of the stem there. And we're terminating that with our flail mower before we then rototill it. Um, it was it, it was not possible to the the flail the rototiller by itself could deal with some some uh, you know shorter cover crops but if it got too tall much taller than what you see in that top picture it would have to be flail mode before rototilling and for the early season the things that we planted first that early brassica field for the April fifteenth plant date we would make sure that there was nothing 
planted the fall before so that we had bare soil. We didn't have to contend with any cover crop uh, at that point, or that was where the fall seeded uh, oats would go. Uh, we also, like I mentioned, had some hand managed spaces and it's much easier to get something planted in that early spring window with the hand managed space because you're not worrying about a tractor mudding the whole place up. You can use a broad fork or maybe skip the broad forking step that that time um, and and just hoe in some some compost and 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 any weeds and plant. This left hand picture is some scallions that are planted out here. Uh, we would start scallions in open flats in just like in big rows of, of them. And then we'd bare root them into groups of four and plant them every uh, four inches. For, so they uh, grow into a clump of scallions that we would just then harvest in, in, a, in a group right there. Um, but it's important because the, to think about how you're going to get things planted in the spring in this cool season, because it, because it is so cool and because it's a typically wet time of the year, the windows for getting the work done are so few and far between, and I know I'm, I'm probably speaking to the choir here, but, but having more options for getting things in at the time, whether it's a crew of people who are able to get in there and, and do multiple jobs at one time with two, splitting up the crews, or having multiple uh, redundancy in machinery like we had at Featherstone uh, with two of each tractor or, and two of each implement so that you could have two teams going out there and getting that work done. Uh, it's important to do that. And even with that, sometimes it's hard. And so I, we, have, we have thought through whether fall preparing beds makes any sense. And um, we thought about laying plastic at Featherstone in the fall for our early things. We left our... Um, plastic mulch beds made at the or student organic farm here and planted our onions into last year's plastic beds um, so that the, be the bed would already be made and we wouldn't have to be out there early on mudding things up or worrying that our plants were getting too big. Um, they're not great. They're not perfect solutions, but these are options that are out there. Um, also, the growth conditions of, at this time of year are, are wet, as you know, well know, I'm sure. Weed growth is fast, cultivation windows are short, and, but, it, but it is possible to cultivate out there, but even before it's uh, too wet to till. You only need to work that top inch of the soil. So there is some, uh, often a time when it's, it really pays to get out there with a little trowel and, 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 and look and scratch around and see, okay, if I work just the top inch of the soil, is it dry enough that inch down that I can flip up some weeds before they get super rooted down in there? Um, this is a very wet situation in this picture. Uh, this field was, was, was always a wet mess. And um, I'm glad I don't farm it anymore, to be honest with you. <laughs> that put, this, this, um, this puddle that's out here in the middle, right here, sometimes that thing would, would never dry up in the year. And we would, uh, we would just plant up to it. And then we would go to the other side and plant beyond it. We would lose out on some production those years. And it was a bad year one year when we were planting potatoes, which really significantly decreased our yield that year. Another option for cultivation in the, uh, in, in the spring when you cannot actively get in there and scratch up the soil is flame weeding, uh, much more effective on broad leaves than grasses, but you can still knock grasses back. Um, and, and this is a good thing to do. This is a carrot bed. Um, it's essential to do before your carrots come up uh, for a good stand of carrots. Um, it'll even, it, even if it's grass weeds, it can knock them back and give your carrots a little bit of a chance. Um, but I've got to think on the next, yeah, right here. This was a situation where I was relying too heavily on my, on my uh, flame weeding. These are a weed called Venus mallow or Venice mallow. Um, and this is a little, these little things that look like basil seedlings right here. Uh, and they are very prostrate and fleshy. And they are, when they're that close to the soil, they can be insulated by the soil and not have that, the action of the flame weeder doesn't, doesn't uh, always hit them when they're that low. So in the cool season in the spring, it's not reliable for this weed. And sadly, this is at Middlebrook Farm. We ended up with a, a pretty bad case 
a pretty bad situation with them that season because of that. I see a few uh, chat things. What um, implement, uh, Rodney, are you asking what implement do I use to weed one inch deep? What equipment? Oh, I see, I see. Danelle, yeah. same. Okay, so for weeding one inch deep, um, gosh, I did not include that in this presentation. It was in my one last week, but the what we relied on primarily at Featherstone was, the, uh, was a basket weeder on the belly mounted cultivating tractor with tine weeder on the back. Um, the, the other ones that we would use would be for like a, a very early, you can, a basket will throw too much, will be too messy to, to get a carrot seeding right when it germinates. So we would use um, cutaway discs, little, um, you know, small discs that are angled like this, that get leave a maybe a one to two inch band on uh, uh, around the carrot and that slices away the the soil and then behind those cutaway discs some l-shaped sweeps that undercut and get uh maybe a seven to nine inch wide uh you know clean area on either side of those cutaway discs so then you're left with a narrow strip that is weedy just in the in with the carrots um and any other direct seeded thing. And if you've stale bedded and flame weeded enough times before that crop, then there aren't too terribly many weeds that come up in, in the in the uh, in the row with that with that crop. And um, and if you have and some people use finger weeders to then crumble up that little one to two inch wide thing. Uh, Danelle and Roddy, does that make sense? With like what I mean when I say finger weeders? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Sorry, didn't mean to belabor that. If that was, uh, if y'all got that two two minutes ago. <laughs> All right. Um, and flame weeding is less effective when it's humid or when it's dewy. In addition to with those weeds are like right up on the ground there. That's one weed, you know. And and most times, if a weed is just germinated, it's good, you know. But these ones, for some reason, this it was not effective that year with our Venus mallow or Venice mallow. <laughs> the, and uh, so another thing to think about with these, um, you, just because you're growing out of season, you don't, you don't have purslane and, and lamb's quarter and pigweed, there are plenty of weeds out there. Uh, and it, that, that Venus mallow came up every single uh, month of the year, but uh, it seemed like, but uh, chickweed is a big one in the high tunnels and in the fields. And these are, and shepherd's purse, henbit, dandelions, all these. Um, it's of course difficult to control these in the wet springs. And um, if you are leaving plastic mulch in the field, then like that, that picture in the last slide with that giant chickweed, that is from a chickweed that was in a plastic mulch hole that overwintered that whole you know winter. And then I pulled it up and used it as a wig that day. That was um, a funny day. Um, this was a, uh, an experiment with different uh, types of, of uh, broadcast cover crop in a sweet corn field. You can see the corn stalks in here and a stripe right here of, of, of a clover, a stripe right here of something else, stripe right here of just weeds it looks like. Um, so a cover crop stand that is not full is going to give you more of these cool season weeds, which can be a problem. You can see dandelions just are a, a definite issue in this field. Um, and I mentioned, and as I said before, tunnel production in salads, chickweed, henbit, these are, these were primary, you know, bad weeds for us in our salad mix in the, in the tunnels. And you can control these with tarps, fabrics, mulching. You could till this all up, cultivation, same things as warm season weeds. Um, we grew some rhubarb and asparagus. These are things to not be forgotten about. They're perennials, but uh, uh, we grew maybe, oh, I don't know, an eighth of an acre of, of rhubarb, of, sorry, of asparagus. And then this is our rhubarb patch. It was just a little something for the, for the um, farm stand and for our CSA shareholders. So our field rotation, each of these is a half of an acre. I'm going to just zoom through this right here just to get to show we applied compost twice. We got as many cover crops in there as possible. And these ones were the ones we leaned on for that field production to last us through the winter to those these cold season crops 
And when I say cold season on corn, I, that one's uh, the exception there. That one we saved popcorn and field corn to give to our CSA members. There's some shots, some pretty glamour shots of our cold season crops. This is Jerusalem artichoke, which we grew in our uh, edible forest garden, our permaculture plot, and gave the, and dug and gave that out to um, to our customers. And now a couple of um, focus, I'm gonna focus in on a couple crops. Our garlic, we planted and mulched in late October, or early November. This is a shot of it coming up in, oh, April or May. And, um, you know, we, we mulched it with straw. Some people mulch it with plastic mulch. I, 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 I laughed when I went and picked up our seed potatoes at an Amish farm at, when I was at this farm and he was mulching his garlic with, uh, with, with plastic mulch and, and us non-Amish were mulching with straw. And I thought that was quite, just did, something didn't match up uh, in, in my mind with that, didn't compute. Um, but some people just do it on bare ground now. And interestingly, I was talking with uh, Crystal Stewart Cortens um, from New York. She is a farmer out there, also works for Extension. And she did, has been doing a lot of research on garlic planting and grows a quite, a, I think at least an acre of it out there. And she's now planting in September. And I thought, well, gosh, isn't that terribly early? Don't you get garlic coming like poking up out of the ground in the fall. And I've always heard that's bad for it. And she said, well, two things. No, it think, I think of it like, like daffodils or, or one of these spring uh, bulbs that comes up through the, through the ground. And that, that tip of the leaf may get nipped by the frost, but, but the, the growing point is down protected in there. And it, it doesn't have any effect on the yield, she says. And by planting it in early September, she avoids any wet weather. So, you know, October, if you're going for that late October, you're, you're, you're trying to dodge the storms. Um, and, and so she, she just, you know, go, goes, goes in, in September and, and doesn't worry about it. Um, so something to think about. Not advocating it necessarily for our situation, but it's something to think about it. Maybe, maybe a trial on your farms or my farm at the research farm here. Here we are bringing it in, usually in July. I've got a July birthday. I enjoyed garlic harvest for my birthday. Winter squash, it's important to harvest winter squash before frost. It can take a light kiss of frost, but it's best done before frost. We would cure it in our vacant greenhouse um, for a couple of weeks before moving it into our warm cooler. We'd also cured onions in here or in our tunnels. I mentioned some field corn uh, that we had in our cornfields. This is a, a fun thing that we give out to our CSA shares uh, in around Thanksgiving time. Here we are, big push to, to bring all the, the storage crops in uh, in, the, in the late fall. Here we are bringing in our Brussels sprouts and cabbage. Big old storage kohlrabi there. You can see these broccolis right here have gone past we usually pick the, the center crowns and then many side shoots down to about quarter size and then we'd let them go. Here's more of those storage kohlrabis, a butternut and a giant Napa. I think that's a Bilko. Yeah, Danelle, any advice on harvesting storing kohlrabi? So first of all, go with the variety Cossack. That's the storage kohlrabi variety. It's And it is what I do with it to be honest, because it's just as good. It's amazing how in March you can get this kohlrabi out of the cooler and it's just as crisp as when you put it in there. It's, it's, it's astonishing. It's, um, I, I, it doesn't, I can't promise it's going to hold much longer than March, um, under, you know, under good conditions, but, uh, and who knows with your cooler, I don't, I don't know anything about it, but you know, it might not store that long, but you can, you can, it stores well. Um, but what I'm, uh, you could, they are just as good at a, at a normal kohlrabi size as they are at a larger one. And these ones are obscenely big. Like these are, are like scare the customer big right here in this left-hand picture. Um, so uh, we were proud of them, but it was not, you know, people were, people were not psyched to be getting these things to take home with them. So I'd, I'd, I'd advise, you know, no more than a small cabbage, maybe at harvest size to, for these things to be appealing to the customer. Um, anyhow, um, just just store it like a, like like any anything else. But Cossack is 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 the important variety. Oh, and 
they're just as good small as they are big. So what I would typically do is I'd plant them every six inches and I'd plant and I'd harvest every other one as my fresh kohlrabi and then let the every 12 and the, the other ones at 12 inch spacing get a little bit bigger to, to storage size for harvesting. And um, I believe our planting date for that, let's see, I've got it back here. I've got another window open here. Uh, I wanna say it's, because it's a brassica and it grows fairly fast. I wanna say it's like middle of July, but it could even be August. Anybody else on this call grow, uh, growing storage kohlrabi and have a plant date that they use, that they rely on here in, uh, in Iowa? There it is. Uh, July 10th is what we would is when these ones were planted in this picture, which I think could be pushed a little bit later, especially if you're not trying to get them that size, right? All right, I, I'll take that silence of, about kohlrabi and, and as as. Uh, nobody's got anything to say about that. All right, parsnips, good. These are something, you know, we plant these April 15th. These are one of the first things we plant and we, they, don't, they take all season to grow. And uh, they're good for harvesting in the fall. And they're also good for harvesting the following spring. They will overwinter just fine um, in the ground. And I, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pet project of mine to try to get the longest root. So here are two pictures of me uh, with, my, with my crazy uh, curiosity of uh, trying to get the longest root. And I, that November harvest one, I, 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 that was the longest one I've ever gotten there. Um, but there's representative of the size that they can attain with by overwintering is this picture of Emma down here in the orange jacket with their two monster uh, parsnips. Um, but those, so those things are uh, very, very hardy over the winter, no protection needed, just a, you know, snow or no snow. So at the student organic farm, we had two coolers, a warm cooler at 55 degrees for winter excuse me, winter squash and potato, sweet potatoes, and then a 34 degree uh, cooler for everything else. And we would plant, you know, store a lot of things in these bulb crates. Um, they were free and, uh, but they, you know, it's a lot of work with your back. I did like um, using these, um, the, like the bins that these cabbages are in that we could stack. Um, I'm really liking seeing these U-boats. Uh, is anybody, um, does that ring a bell to anybody? Should I elaborate? No, I see Danelle shaking your head. That I'll, So a U-boat, Jordan Scheibel's got them at Middleway. He got them with the funding that with his, uh, with that clean start food safety program that he was in. Um, uh, that Iowa Valley RCND is uh, s supported. But um, these U-boats are these, um, oh, six foot long, five or six foot long metal carts that have um, a wheel in each corner. But like the lumber carts at like the at Home Depot or Lowe's, they've got that middle wheel also so they can rotate really nice, like on a dime. And they're called a U-boat because they have this long, kind of like a luggage cart at a hotel. You know, they've got this long, you know, pipe thing on each end so you can grab on and, and steer it around. And you could put a number of these like, bulb crates or these Rubbermaid totes on them and just stack them up and move them real easily around and they and they fit in nicely and maneuver. I, I, I kind of, um, I think that's a really nice thing to, to, to look into maybe for a, a, a smaller farm that's, that's trying to cram a bunch of stuff into a cooler and save uh, your back. And Jordan Scheibel, I, I don't know where he sourced them, and I've I and but I've heard at least two other farmers independently calling them U boats, and so I uh, he I, I that was the first I'd ever heard of him when he was talking about them. He could help you maybe f uh, with sourcing if you uh, or I, if you want to ask me, I could ask him. Just if you're curious, let me know. Um. So in these bins, we would also divide them up with these like black plastic corrugated panels. Um, that we've got a couple of varieties of celeriac on the right here, uh, and uh, a couple of different varieties of uh, rutabaga on the left. We've got Joan is what that little tape says there, right here is Joan, and we've got Laurentian as the other one here. And 
you know, we were, we were doing variety trials on, uh, on all these things. So we would try to not only see what yielded the best, but also which one stored the best. So that's why we would keep them separate in storage. Um, you don't, you know, I don't have, unfortunately, great uh, advice for you because I don't I don't have a solid memory of of whether Laurentian or Jones stored better. I just by looking at these rutabaga, I like the Laurentian look of their Laurentian way more than I like that of Joan because of the uniformity of large size. But again, that that could be how it was planted. Also, Rodney's asking parsnips take so long to germinate. Any advice? Gosh, I I, I commiserate. Um, and and it, more time to flame, but you got to keep them wet. Uh, I think yeah, just investing in the in the effort to keep them wet and a couple of good flame weedings uh, to to kill the weeds ahead of time or what some people do is they lay burlap down over the top of the bed or a plastic sheet or landscape fabric to keep the weeds down until the they they come up um i i don't have great uh, advice uh but uh going with going with a a, a solid like what there are varieties that I wouldn't go with a, with an heirloom variety necessarily, but that's just my tendency. I like, I, I like to go for the uniform ones um, and, and hybrids are more, more so that way, but uh, there are some, there are some decent ones out there. Javelin, Lancer. I think there's a, another one that I just saw in the catalogs this year, different type of parsnip that I was curious about. I'm going to be growing them again this year. Susan asks, is 55 optimal storage temp? And 55 is the is about the threshold they say for cold, uh, like as cold as you want to take sweet potatoes or, um, and then winter squash is, it does well at that as well. So yeah, yes, more or less that is optimal for those two crops. You could do 50 maybe with winter squash, but because we had sweet potatoes in there too, it was 55. Um, more pictures of our cooler. Um, the things that stored the best were the potatoes, cabbage, butternuts. Other squashes didn't store as well as the butternuts. Um, beets, carrots, onions, and kohlrabi, they all did great. Uh, celeriac could be added to that. We have this bin full of celery that we would bring in just for a Thanksgiving share. Um, so it, we'd, we'd bring it in, you know, right when it was getting really cold. And then we'd give it out, oh, you know, middle of middle of, uh, of November to the, to the customers or something like that. And we'd make sure to give out the acorns and the delicata squashes in the first um, month or two of the, of the winter. Oh, the, the cabbage was in, was in these, these bins right here, Danelle, um, and just left open. And when it was time to distribute it, and we did this at Featherstone too, when it was time to distribute it, we would just, uh, we would just you know, chop the the stem end of it and peel the leaves that were that had gotten wilty, and then the the core was was good. And you know, is a couple leaves each time seemed like well, a couple leaves at first, and then later on it would be maybe four or five. And how late did they store? The cabbages we would they they stored well into into February March at, at for us at Featherstone and and same at at the Student Organic Farm that was something we would hold on to a uh, a bin of those cabbages and a thing of the kohlrabi because March April was a really uh, lean time in the high tunnels every the thing that had overwintered had bolted and the things that we had planted in the spring weren't ready yet so those things were like. Um, things that we would give out uh, to bulk out the shares at that time that were still like fresh seeming. Uh, variety suggestions for red cabbage. Yeah, let me see. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I don't, not off the top of my head. The ones that we, that we relied on at, um, at uh, Featherstone, they, they dropped green storage. Um, expect is a really good green storage. And storage number four, meh, not so great, but expect is pretty, pretty good. Um, I'm gonna scroll down here. This is this is from 2015, mind you. Um, the variety that I'm gonna talk about here. I'm gonna look at my cabbage plantings. Where are you, cabbage? We would plant it on. 
Caitlin is your favorite green storage cabinet. Carmen, thank you so much. Thank, uh, and I will get back to you about this if we have time. How's that sound? Um, Caitlin, isn't isn't Caitlin Carmen a one of these like sauerkraut varieties? It's very huge. Okay, I I sus I I I think it is a, a I agree. I, I've heard good things about its storage, and, and it is big. And I and if I'm not mistaken, Caitlin was bred to be um, really good for making sauerkraut. So not that it isn't also good at being a storage cabbage for fresh eating, but um, it's one it's one that has like high dry matter content for if you're selling it to a sauerkraut producer. Um, This is just a, a, a example of our of our visual SOP. Well, it's not a visual; it's an SOP um, of how to use potatoes. Because we had so many um, student workers on the farm who were doing things unsupervised uh, that we had a lot of signage up to show them what to do and in which order. So we would give out our russet narcota, uh, russet potatoes first. French fingerling was always the best storer, and all the ones in in between would we'd give out in the middle didn't really matter. We just would sort of rotate through and not give a, our customers uh, the same thing every week because we did give potatoes every week. All right, so for crop protection in order, like once it starts getting cold and you wanna protect things, uh, step one would be the row cover. And most of these crops, again, can take it without row cover. Um, but if you wanna protect some certain things from a, from a, a, a cold snap that's coming a night in the mid twenties and you're not, and you were not uh, expecting you know, that and your crops are still out in the, in the field, row cover is, is a first step, but understand that row cover touching leaves can cause damage to those leaves. So su some sort of structure to support that row cover, if it's gonna be really cold and you're protecting something like head lettuce. Um, like wire, number nine wire or conduit hoops or something like that, usually wire because it's so much easier to deploy than these big hoops. Um, but yeah, you could go with a low tunnel. I'll show you my low tunnel in a little, in a few slides here. Then after that, you really move into the high tunnel protection. That's, that's what is going to protect these things best. And then a, after that is having an internal uh, cover inside your high tunnel. And then if you, if you are still, uh, wanting more protection, you add a little bit of extra heat for the extreme cold times. Um, one thing that's nice about cold temps is it brings out the reds best in these uh, crops. So this is a picture of some bull's blood beets, uh, an outdoor planting of it that is, has just gotten gorgeous and is going to be delicious to eat and add such beautiful uh, character to the salad mix that they're going to go into. And if they get too big on you, then you can always bunch them and, they, and, and they're a nice bunch crop as well. All right, so at my house in Des Moines, I am currently, I don't have a caterpillar tunnel or a high tunnel. I'm using just low tunnels made with conduit at this point. And I'm just curious, like what can be done here? And so take this or leave this, uh, you know, some things are successes, some things are not. Um, but I just got some conduit at Ace Hardware and I bought this, um, I, oh, I bought some rebar and drove it and cut it into pieces and drove it into the ground and put the conduit over it. I got this batten line uh, strap from Farmer's Friend and wrapped it around and then uh, that holds them taut so that they don't flop one way or the other. Um, the crops have to be full size. This is a general rule for high tunnel growing too. They have to be full size by the beginning of November. Um, and these clips from Farmer's Friend also, they've been so nice for keeping the, the plastic on by putting a rope zigzag over. In the derecho that we had in mid-December, it totally held up in that. It was nerve-wracking for sure for me, but it held up. Um, then another piece of rebar driven in at the end, and all, the whole thing secured with uh, gathered and tied onto that. Uh, I weigh down the edges with sandbags and open it up when it gets really warm. In the winter, where you'd have to vent a high tunnel if it was really sunny and warm outside, these things really just don't get that warm inside. So I, I don't vent them in the, in the winter, but in the, in the spring and fall, I do. Um, this is what it looked like in the spring of 2021. These are, these are uh, Salanovas on the left-hand picture. Uh, most of them survived last winter. And a lot of the um, brassica mix did not survive, but lettuce survived better over here. This is a mix of, I think, that's like encore mix, I think. And then right here is a, a Corvair spinach, which survived well, but it was um, kind of yellowing out because it was planted in a for baby leaf. 
Uh, this is this winter, just a you know week and a half ago. Uh, cilantro doing really really well. I harvested this; it was delicious. I'm going to plant more of that next year. Um, Corvair spinach over on the right planted. Uh, Tra from transplant this year and bigger leaf, so it's looking much better, but it could be tighter spacing, I think. Um, and then this is green oak leaf and frizzy go salanova, and those two are looking really nice. Um, I just harvested some earlier this week, the last of the for the year, but not everything's looking so good. This is the good, there's uh, and and I mentioned that already, but here's the bad and the ugly. Um, the 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 butter leaves. Are, are just melted, not going to come back. Um, and then this is a salad mix. This is a Sulu, Spritzer, no, Spritzer, Sulu, Annapolis, um, lettuce salad mix. And I cut them back to see if they would regrow, but they aren't looking so hot now. I, it's, it's a, we've had longer, colder stretches this winter than we have, than we did last winter. So it's um, not working as well this year. So I'm tempted to get a caterpillar tunnel for my yard. <laughs> All right, so a couple, so that's Michigan State Student Organic Farm. Any questions, uh, uh, the way it's gonna go now is I'm gonna show some slides from Featherstone and our field production of cold season crops there. And then I'm gonna get into high tunnel production. Um, I can skip over Featherstone if you all want and I can get straight into high tunnel production. Um, I just wanna, I, I, I wanna, also, if you have questions about the student organic farm field production, I'd be happy to answer those right now. So first, if you have questions about field production at, at, at Michigan State, let me know right now. So Dan, I'm curious about uh, the sunchokes that you guys grew. You said it was like kind of in a permaculture yeah. area, so mm -hmm. not necessarily like alongside your annual production um was there a reason for that in particular or just because it's um a perennial um, yeah because it's the perennial it had been planted in there and we didn't invest in planting them in our other fields because they were already there and we had more than enough of them in that space but a person could grow a, a bed of them on the edge of a field and you know as a as a perennial mm -hmm. All right, next question. Who wants to hear a, a little bit about the Featherstone field production? Does anybody want to hear a little bit about Featherstone field production? This would be a little bit redundant for those who were in it last week. Iowa Valley RCD, okay, you wanna hear a little bit about it? Okay, I'll, I'll do it. I won't, I won't, I won't go into, um, I won't play the videos that I have on here because there are a number of people who have seen them already. Um, but, uh, if you're curious about seeing that, I'd be happy to share them with you. Um, so we were 250 acres of vegetables. We had a, oh, sorry, of farm. We had 140 of those in vegetables each year. Um, we were certified organic. We had 50 employees in the summer and our gross sales were 2.25 million um, which, you know, when I got there, I was like, that's not really impressive. I was doing 250,000 on, on, on 15 acres before it. That just doesn't, you know, it's a difference between intensive growing and, and, um, efficient mechanized growing, you know, you just, the number per acres. Um, oh, great. Thanks Lance that you can share the size of videos. Perfect. Um, so we were just about an hour North of Decorah, Iowa, and you know, this is bluff country, the driftless region. So we had some fields that were down here in the, in the river valleys. This is like the river is right over here at the base of this bluff. And then we had other fields up on top of bluffs and that sort of spreads out the risk, different microclimates in each place. Um, definitely cooler, you know, we, the thought is on, on, on valleys, right. That the cold air sinks down and you get these, the cold in the, in the valley. Well, we, it, it's, it, that that's probably true, you know, but we would also often see equal, um, frosting of things on the, on the ridges if, for our tomatoes say. So this is what a car cabbage field looked like there. Lettuce or one, this is our early cabbage field. We had a late cabbage, field, uh, fields as well. Uh, this is what spring lettuce looks like there. Our, one of our three kale successions here. Our peas, our spring peas. 
Sugar Anne was the variety we grew so that we wouldn't have to trellis it. It would just with three rows and it would just vine on itself. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's nice. I, it's much more pleasant to harvest peas when they've been trellised, but because we were, it was a CSA crop that we were just trying to grow. So our CSA customers could have one or two weeks of peas. Uh, we didn't want to invest in trellising for that. So we grew the short Sugar Anne variety that would trellis on itself. Sugar Anne is the short one. Um, sweet corn can take a light frost. It's, uh, you know, it's a grass and, um, so, uh, I'm going to finish sweet corn, Rodney, then I'll get to your question. Um, so we did two successions planted, transplanted, uh, so that because it was grown as SH, we were growing the variety where the sweetness level of corn of SH2, which Germany is very poorly in cold soils. So we would transplant two successions and then the soils would be warm enough that we could direct seed. And by doing that, we could get earlier corn. Early July was, uh, was what we were hoping for. One year we did get 4th of July, um, but we'd transplant it with a, a mechanical transplanter. It's a carousel type that where you drop it in the little cup, it rotates around, it drops it and then puts it in the ground for you. Rodney, what are you saying about in peas mustard? I, or elaborate, you can unmute if you want. Oh, you sorry, you're muted. There, all right. Yeah. Mustard is a weed, comes in in spring, like with the peas and oh did we have any mustard weeds yes no yeah. we, yes yeah so th that's like one of those spring those, those like like shepherd's purse or rocket or something you know these mustard weeds that that are totally uh yes we had we had bad weeds in our in our peas and our spring carrots and all that you know it was it was one these were some of our weediest crops because we had poor weed control in the spring and we were we would focus on other things that were more that made us more money so um this is doesn't look too weedy at this point but it would if you were here if you were to view this in a month it would look bad so yes yes you're right all right for winter squash um we would uh clip and place these on every other bed you can see they're growing on rate this is a bed of with plastic mulch just showing through there. Here's the next bed over. We would clip the ones from this bed, place it on this bed, clip the ones from this bed, place it right here. Then we would drive straddling this one and throw the, the squash up to the people in between and bring the squash in that way. Uh, I mentioned earlier that squash can take a light frost, but this was quite the heavy frost that these ones took. You can see um, this discolored section right here on this pumpkin that, that shows uh, quite a bit of, of frozen tissue. And then it got about this deep into this cross section that I took, this little chunk that I took out. So a uh, cautionary tale there. Um, here's cabbage, uh, cabbage harvest. I'm just gonna play the, a little bit of this one just so you can see what the implement is that they are uh, harvesting with. This is a veg veyer machine, the conveyor that goes across four beds. These folks harvest cabbage put it on the veg veyer, it carries it up, to, it carries it across and then up this, uh, this thing here, and then up to these guys on the trailer. So that's how we would bring in the cabbage at Featherstone. Uh, here's broccoli. Uh, this is a, a custom made um, broccoli harvesting conveyor that mounted on this tractor here that pulls a trailer that stacks where you stack up the boxes once they're packed. Um, it's got a pneumatic air compressor here. I'll show you that in a bit, but it, the broccoli comes in here and uh, to this person right here, these silver boxes here, are pneumatic bunching machines. You have a, you can see he's got this box of rubber bands here, puts a rubber band around these four posts, pulls up on this little 
on this little thing here. It opens up the, the rubber band. You put the broccoli in, it slices off the bottom of the broccoli and closes the band around the broccoli right there. And then you put it in the box. Um, these in the warehouse, it comes in and, it, and ice is poured onto it. There's a big ice maker in the warehouse. Uh, and then that's how it goes to the store like that because and the ice helps it keep it cool. Um, and then these bins right here are being cooled off to store for a few weeks for our fall shares. Uh, inside, they've got a plastic bin turned upside down so the core is hollow and, uh, and that helps it cool down faster um, and stores better. For carrots, I'm gonna, I will play this video just for those who weren't here last week. This is our uh, Scott Viner root harvester from the mid 1900s that harvests and conveys the carrots into the bins. Chops the tops off right there and throws the tops off to the side. All right, so that's a little glimpse of cool season field crop production at Featherstone Farm. Now I'm gonna, the rest of this time is gonna be uh, spent talking about high tunnel production in seriously cool season. So we promised our, our customers three fresh greens each week in the winter uh, with a minimum of 10 items in the box. This is a picture from one of our, uh, our from our wholesale salad tunnel. Um, and there were some warm crops that we would do in the summer, but we won't talk about those in this uh, one. So we had four tunnels for year round CSA. We had one big one for wholesale salad that you saw another uh, uh, sort of big one for a farm stand and a mobile tunnel for, that we would do all winter spinach in the winter and a, tw and a heated one that was uh, heated to 40 degrees. So we would give out every single week in the winter, November through April, 22 weeks of garlic, some type of onion, whether it's leeks or onions or scallions. Um, we had scallions in the green, in the high tunnels. Those things do pretty well in the high tunnels and um, and then storage onions and, and leeks from the field, carrots and potatoes every week. The, so the way to read this is that there are 22 weeks in this winter, the November to April period, and these ones came every week, and then spinach came 13 weeks out of the 22, salad mix 12 on down uh, there. And then the storage crops that came from the field and the number of times that they were in the share. Spinach is the hardiest crop. Uh, again, large leaf, as you saw in my low tunnels, the baby leaf yellows out and the large leaf, if it's transplanted, does the best at, at producing throughout the year. Um, we would transplant these, these would get planted in, um, I believe, in, well, it'll, it'll be in a couple of slides, so I'm not even gonna hazard a guess right now. Um, but it's super, super sweet and it's delicious. And so I am, I am, I'm trying to get folks to, to, to reverse the tide of, of vegetables being shipped from California and to take some of this frost kissed, this frost sweetened spinach and, and start selling it for buku bucks back to California um, consumers. Uh, the stems are the sweetest part. Uh, so here it is in end of March and it's still going well. Downy mildew is a, is a disease that you need to watch for on spinach, and it can really uh, persist in the tunnels if you, if you do get it. We would harvest this by hand rather than knife harvesting it, just taking the outside leaves, putting it in the bins, and then bagging those uh, big leaves after being washed. We would uh, plant our summer crops in here on 415 because that's, that was more or less frost-free underneath these internal covers that, that were draped over with this, these, this green, spare greenhouse plastic. Other people use row cover, but it went over these frames every night. Totsoy is the first thing to bolt in the early part of the year, uh, January, early January um, to, to early February. And um, 
then Komatsuna, I believe, after that. If you ha have not ever had the uh, what I what I like to call kale rob, which is the um, the flower stalk of kale in like say mid April when it starts to bolt, it is just delightfully delectable. It is it's like broccoli rob. It's it's so good, and so you should. Uh, this is a, a crop if you're growing kale over winter. Don't rip it when it starts to flower. Uh, chop those flowers and sell them for more money because it's a premium product. Kale and chard are getting replanted to tomatoes here. Uh, you can see the tomatoes in the back of the house. Um, the kale bolt and the collards bolt before the chard does. We're hanging on to this chard here because remember this this March April period is a it can be a really lean time in the houses and so as much greenery as we can get for our for our customers from this crop here we want to so we'll delay planting our tomatoes maybe by a week in this part of the house um, and and, uh, and and plant that part a week late just so we can have the greenery here. This one's been replanted. You can see these bare beds in the front. You can see little radishes just coming up here. These were already planted to radishes once um, in February, and these ones are replanted now at the end of April to uh, to, to be another crop before um, before this house needs to be planted for other things. But these lettuces are also February planted, ready to harvest now. Um, about, there are 30 heads in each of these beds and with our um, so we would har harvest two and a half ish beds per week um, for our CSA because 75 uh, year round customers. Uh, Danelle asks any planting in January, February, any way to get new radishes and kale in March? Yes, you can get new radishes in March. Like that's, that is what these ones were likely, like these were planted in. Um, it's, you can plant in January, but you don't get any more benefit by planting in January than you do in early February usually because the day length just isn't long enough to inspire them to grow. So right now is about the time when 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 planting in the ground in the tunnels is really going to start uh, to to show to pay dividends. Um, so yeah, the, and the radishes are one of the first things that we would plant there. Um, lettuce, I think we would wait until March 1st maybe to plant just because it might be too cold for those, but I can't, I, I'm having a hard time remembering and I think the dates are in here later. Um, and, and I can get you, I can share, one of the things I'll share with Lance um, after this is I will share our tunnel planting calendar and also um, uh, our tunnel planting uh, uh, cheat sheet for spacing and everything. Rodney's asking about the growing medium, the soil. It is all soil grown um, here, and we would add our amendments were mostly compost. Um, but then we had start we started adding micronutrients and increasing sulfur because our pH was way, 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 way high because we kept adding compost. So don't add compost always just because it's good. It's compost because it can really jack your pH up, which can cause nutrient stress in in a lot of crops. Um, I'm going to just show that I, rather than buying pre-mixed salad mixes, I would advise or uh, you to grow individual by themselves, or if you want to mix, grow it in stripes like this, uh, so that you, because each of them grows differently, you can harvest them at the right uh, maturity stage without having to uh, work around other things that aren't the right size. That way you can avoid giant leaves in your salad. And um, yeah, if, if, if possible, just grow a whole bed of one thing. It's easier than horsing around with, with trying to plant stripes. But we use the four row Johnny's pinpoint cedar and each of these stripes is one four row pinpointer wide. So it, it really isn't a big deal. Um, but you know, there's different things like red Russian has really long wind internodes uh, and it, yellow, it gets these like yellow leaves on it too. So it's kind of a, I, I, we nick, I, I have mixed it from my mix at this point. Um, and other people are swearing by this redder red Russian called KX1 now. Um, Mizuna grows faster, so this would, would be your giant leafed one. And I also would, uh, would not advise to grow ruby streaks because it's just, at least in this volume, it's so frilly that the mouthfeel of it is, is a poor experience for many uh, diners. 
So lessons learned from the, from what we were doing here. We had too many, uh, three out of the four, if you look at them here, three out of the four had like toothed or margins on the, uh, on the leaves. And only one of them here had the smooth margin. So it actually, people enjoyed eating it better when there was like beet greens and lettuce mixed in with, you know, this, these things, because those things would be softer and have more of a smooth leaf margin and wouldn't be as, uh, they many people called it spiky in their mouth, but that that is uh, I, I, it's not really spiky, but I, maybe you know what I'm what maybe you can commiserate or imagine what they're talking about. Um, here's some single variety lettuce beds. Uh, just to point out that see that one, you know, too thick, you can make it too thick. You want it to be thick, but this one was seeded both directions and it was too thick to ever grow. Um, you can see a nicely spaced one right here, all the way down, except there is a little bit of a gaps right in here, but oh well. Uh, and you can see some, ch either this is chickweed or this is a place where a bunch of seeds fell out right here. But um, this is one succession that's a little older than this one. And you want them to be thick enough that they hold, that they're shoulder to shoulder, but not so thick that they spread out sideways into oops, excuse me, into the space in between the rows. Because for harvest, it's easiest when you can get your hands around one row and slice and work your way down the row. If they're all woven together because they're too thick in the row, it's very difficult and very messy and leaves a lot in the bed that's uncut or gets you in your hand and harvested things that you don't want. Um, there's a lot of wasted space in these tunnels. Don't take that as a, as a guide of what to do. Um, we did sw switch these to uh, get rid of all these little pathways here. Eventually, this was originally designed this way as a, as a, for experimental design to replicate plantings when we were first at the Student Organic Farm trying this uh, concept out, but um, to replicate like Elliot Coleman's uh, work in, in Michigan. Uh, sorry, he was in Maine, we were in Michigan. We were trying to replicate it in Michigan. Um, so I would advise long beds the entire way so you get the most bang for your buck um, out of these things. Um, some farms are actually going with no pathways now. Here's a picture from uh, Lakeview Hill Farm and uh, Bear Creek Organic Farm. These are two uh, farms in the Traverse City, Michigan area that are using no pathways in their, in their winter tunnels now to maximize the space that they can grow in. And you can see this row cover, this giant row cover is suspended by these, by this high tensile wire that's uh, I think probably attached to the end walls. And that is the internal cover that is supported and protecting these things. Uh, well, uh, so we did heat this one house at 40 degrees. That was as low as the, no, I think that was as low as the thermostat went. Um, I would say even heating it to 35 would, or 20, 28 would 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 work um, just great for keeping it warmer also and keeping growing faster, but we were able to get more harvest out of this. Um, so uh, Susan, I'm going to touch on the economical good tunnels for home garden backyards um, in, in, in a, in a, in a, uh, I'll just, I'll say now, Susan, the government fund programs, you can look into equip uh, funding with NRCS. They will pay for NR, uh Caterpillar tunnels from Farmer's Friend. Um, I have many farmer friends who are, or I have a couple of farmer friends who are, who are um, doing that um, currently. I, as far as whether that works in a home garden backyard, you'd have to talk to your neighbors and your municipality about whether they'd accept that type of thing in your backyard. I chose to go with those little low ones because that was what I thought I could get away with at the time. I may be trying to go with the Caterpillar tunnel from Farmer's Friend in the future though, or make it, or bending my own but prefab farmer's friend is a good one. Um, all right, so all that stuff's done in Michigan, but can we grow all that stuff in the high tunnels here? Um, it's, if you look like they're in light blue 5B, about the same as Southern, you know, Iowa. Um, and they are much darker in the winter, much cloudier than we are here in Iowa. And if you know anything about tunnels, then you know that more sun is a, makes for a warmer day in the, in, the, uh, in the winter and more growth of your crops and a warmer experience for those crops. Here's, so, okay, maybe we have more days that are cold here. It's been, a, I mentioned a cold February, a cold January already, but it's not that different between Des Moines and East Lansing. And maybe it'd be, and granted, this is Des Moines, not 
Southwest Iowa, but uh, I hear it was 60 degrees there today. Gosh. Days below minus 10, about the same. So I think it's possible, I think it's doable here, but maybe we have more days in a row that are that cold. I don't know, that seems kind of fishing for it, but I'm curious to look into the data. And also it, uh, you can mitigate any extreme cold by heating. You don't have to heat above freezing, it could be 25 degrees just to take the edge off because it's those temps that get down to 15 for a really long period of time that are really troublesome. So Danelle, the this is like, the inf when you were asking about like what to grow and what gives the is the most economical or most bang for your buck like this is sort of like the what we were what we would shoot for right here this whole this is the whole breakdown of it right here so the, our mantra was the right crop planted at the right time with multiple harvests and properly protected so that's a hardy crop and variety that's almost any variety of kale but there are many that are labeled as like more hardy than others in in like johnny's has really talks about that a lot in their catalog um bright lights charred was decent but we only grew it because we wanted a diversity of greens for our csa customers if you wanted and, and something that was the most cold hardy um kale and chard are basically not it they 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 will uh they will show damage at the really cold temperatures but if you were to heat your kale house a little bit that would that would have uh help out with um with having them not get damaged um but here are the uh, here's the whole big list of of uh of of crops that we grew um winter blooms excuse me winter bloomsdale spinach corvair is good um there's many other varieties uh, that are that are quite good of spinach. Um, lettuce heads will you can harvest until about Christmas and uh, and then replant to radishes or something like that in the spring. We would rely on deep purple and evergreen hardy scallions. These are the varieties of, of salad mix that we would grow. And Asian heads, Asian heads like joy choy would be this thick ribs of joy choy would just freeze in a really cold winter, but it was really good before Christmas. And if you didn't have a cold snap after Christmas, it would hold until, you know, early February. Um, but baby pak choy uh, would, would do, would, would might, might do wonders um, because they're smaller uh, and baby things tend to survive better than big things because they can thaw out faster. Um, Komatsuna was a very, very cold, hardy Asian green that we would able to be able to take, multiple harvests off of the of leaves and then cut the head at the end. Um, radishes and, and salad turnips work until Christmas, but then not afterwards. Cilantro and parsley are very cold hardy. Oh yeah, so here it is bigger. I should have gone ahead and gone to that, sorry. And we will share this with you so you don't have to take all these notes or have a photographic memory. So everything needs to be fully grown by early November. The crops are gonna grow slower in October, um, but like this year where we had more sun and more heat, it, the, it's gonna grow crops faster. If you plant later than that uh, early November or that, uh, that the ideal planting times, you're gonna get a spring harvest. It's not like it'll necessarily die over the winter, it'll just stall at baby size and then keep growing in the spring. So our kale scallions and chard are planted in August, but the heads planted in September and salads between September and October. So the goal for the most money, Danelle, it, oh, sorry, here's the exact plant dates for all those things. And Danelle, you were, multiple harvests is the big key. Like planting broccoli in the house while it might like do well as at producing a harvest, it would give you like maybe one big harvest of, of, of heads and then you could maybe get side shoots. But it having a, a crop that will, salad mix is a relatively high value item as is spinach and having being able to have that crop that is high value and then get multiple harvests off of it is the key to making the most money off of your, uh, off, off of these crops. So salad, herbs, and spinach are all multiple harvest things throughout the winter. Kale, komatsuna, chard, also bunched crops that you could get multiple harvests off of, but um, they were good for us because they gave diversity and added value to our CSA since people, so people weren't always getting spinach or salad mix. 
um, they're not quite as tolerant of those of that cold as the uh, as as the um, salad herbs and spinach. The kale would just it would take it, but the leaves would just droop down, and they would be like a you know the a bunch of kale would just be floppy, you know, and it's it's just because it's it's that's mid that crisp excuse me, stem takes damage, but it's still quite edible. Um, is komatsuna eaten like tatsuo? Yes, it is. It is. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, chopped up and stir fried typically. Yep. And then properly protected means having uh, internal covers on there on those coldest nights. Um, and I didn't mention this at PFI, but it also means hardening off your crops so when it's that transition time between warm weather and cold weather, having that tunnel open, so these crops actually take some frost. And then when it gets really cold, then you pull these internal covers and your crops are hardened off. They're not going, you're not buttoning that whole house up and pulling your internal covers the minute it gets to be like 35 degrees because it's gonna stay on those days when it gets to 35, it's gonna stay 70 underneath this, you know, internal cover inside. And when it then gets down to 22, these crops are gonna be like, holy crap, this sucks and die. Um, and so um, each layer roughly is like one zone South equivalent. So the high tunnel is, sorry, I'm gesturing over here on my screen uh, with my hand. This high tunnel is one layer, like one, like growing one zone South, the internal cover is like another zone South. Conceivably you could do a third layer, but uh, I don't know many people who do that. So um, I mentioned that already, mentioned that already, mentioned that already, that too. Oh, these things will freeze. They're frost tolerant, but they will freeze every night when it's cold. So you need to wait till they thaw in the mornings when to, in order to harvest them. If you harvest them when these crops are frozen, they will thaw out and be mush. If you wait while they are on the plant for them to thaw and then harvest them, then they were they will be good. And then harvesting the right way means harvesting above the growing point so that you can let the, the little leaves inside grow to be bigger ones. Danelle, you got your hand up. What's up? Can I ask a specific question about kale? Have you ever yes. tried yeah. in the field? What we do is we transplant out um, winter boar and we put mm -hmm. them a foot apart and then mm -hmm. we just harvest all year long and they get mm -hmm. tall and they look like palm trees. Have you ever tried doing that inside a high tunnel? Um, or the harvest, winter? Harvesting it, har harvesting it all winter? Like yeah, a, like a little bit plant off. In, plant in July or August or something and let them get tall. Mm -hmm. that, that is what we do basically. Like we would plant them in mid of middle of August and then and then through progressively throughout the winter just take like a little bit off of each of them and they ended up getting about okay. chest high they don't get okay. quite as tall as they would in, in a in a like they would in the field during the main growing season but yeah that is that's that's what we would do is is a few leaves at a time off of you know every winter boar and then every red boar and then every dino and give you know so that over six weeks, our, our CSA customers would get a green bunch, a red bunch, a dino bunch, and then rotate back through. Um, okay, and, sorry, and I missed that. No, that's all right. No, thanks for asking. And we also would grow collards um, for the same uh, sort of thing, just to keep things interesting and different. So... Um, Kale parse, I talked about how kale got damaged. Parsley would also get damaged and be a floppy bunch in the really cold times. Heading crops like lettuce or pak choy, we would reliably cut our lettuce at the end of the uh, of the calendar year to, to give out. But the pak choy we, would, we wanted to hold on to with gambling that it wasn't gonna get super cold. And um, in, in times of like these polar vortexes, vortices, excuse me, um, that the pak choy would just freeze solid and then it would never thaw out again. It would never get warm enough that those watery stems would ever thaw out and it would just be an ice block and it would be done. And um, it would just look worse and worse and worse. So it worked in the ears when it wasn't super cold. So it's a gamble there. But if you were to heat you know, a little bit in there, just to keep the temperature, the minimum temperature a little bit higher, then it would give the chance for that crop to thaw out. Um, you know, 
I have 20 to 25 here. Maybe it's 25 to 28. Uh, Carmen, you use a third row cover. It's going to be 15 below or colder in the unheated tunnel. Yes, yes. 15 below is 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 as cold as actually it ever got um, when I was there at, at the SOF. I think it might have been maybe minus 18 one time, but about 15 below is about as cold as it ever got. And we had temperature data loggers in, in there. And even when it was 15 below, it was it never got below 15 above underneath that internal cover but we didn't use more row covers we just had old greenhouse plastic so um carmen do you find that that is effective um at at a rate at keeping the temperature raised i'll assume yes yeah i can't okay. type that fast <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> yeah please unmute yeah um yeah i i don't have data loggers so okay I don't know, but um, but yeah, I've I've brought head lettuce through thirty below, so I think Whoa. The is yes, because of the because of the triple cover. You're a badass. You are the no, champion. It's cold. <laughs> the lettuce is the badass, isn't it? <laughs> oh man! All right, thank you, Carmen. I appreciate hearing that. Um, so the bummer about the old greenhouse poly, the good thing about row cover is that it's more forgiving. It vents out humidity and, and doesn't, uh, when the sun comes out and you've got the gr old greenhouse poly as your internal cover, it heats up super fast, super hot. And, uh, and we needed prompt venting every single day. So it was like, uh, you know, it was a ball and chain, if you will, for us. So a lot of people who are using row covers, I, I was envious of them. Um, Another limitation we had a lot, like I said, brassicas are a big cold weather tolerant crop. And so we, we had so many that it was, our rotation was brassicas to non-brassicas, back to brassicas to non-brassicas. And we would do that as, as much as possible. Um, we would do radishes on radishes because we justified, oh, it's same amount of time that, you know, uh, one of the, you've got kale in a bed for six months. We got radishes and two successions of radishes and, you know, in three weeks plus three weeks. What may, why, what's the big deal? Um, we didn't try the quick cut greens harvester. It wasn't really on the market yet. And uh, and Salanovas really weren't, uh, we're just starting out. And so we, I didn't have a lot of experience with them at, in the system, but I think it was very promising because a lot of people talk about how cold tolerant those things are. So this is getting close to the end here. Um, in between the tunnels, you, we, we had them spaced out so they wouldn't shade each other in the winter. So we would grow, uh, that also helped snow shed, but we, in the summer, would grow in these spaces. And um, here's some pictures of that. And one thing that we tried out in there that worked decently was uh, some day neutral strawberries that we sold at our farm stand throughout the year. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. That's here's my contact information, and we will be sharing this uh, this slideshow with y'all so that you can have the a copy of these and uh, those other resources that I said I'd send to Lance. So Lance will be sending those out in the next couple of days to y'all, um, and I will stop share now, so that we can be a gallery of folks again. And sorry, I only left three and a half minutes for questions uh, formally, but I'm happy to stay on here longer. If you are, if you, if you want to stay on longer to ask questions, um, I, I will, uh, I will honor that. But if you do have to leave at 830, I will not be insulted. Dan, I'm really curious about the um, growing between the high tunnels, like the yeah. strawberry production that you did. Super cool, very inspiring. Um, I'd love to get to a point where we're growing more fruit, uh, specifically berries that grow Johnson County, but mm -hmm. we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just was hoping you could elaborate on that. Um, Cause it also, one thing that I noticed in the fall in particular, um, with the greenhouse, we had some aphid problems. Mm. And I kind of thought, well, why aren't people using other perennial plants and growing those like along the flanks of um, a greenhouse or a high tunnel to draw in more beneficial insects? That's where my brain goes. Um, but I know that that's not always efficient and or useful um, for certain farming operations, but um, yeah, just curious about your experience with growing in between those two tunnels there. Yeah, most of that's been, so first of all, I, 
I, um, I will, you may have noticed that those spaces were lined with like old four by fours, uh, like lumber as a raised bed, like style thing. I would advise against that for, for doing that. If you were to do it, I would just do it in the ground because it, it made it just harder to get a rototiller in there. It made it harder to walk in the, in the winter to clear snow. If you wanted to use a truck with a snow plow to get that snow out of the way, if you had a really heavy snowfall, then you wouldn't be able to really drive it as easily with that there. Um, uh, of course, you wouldn't want to drive on your strawberries also. I, I understand that, but like, um, so maybe use a snowblower. But anyway, it's just added more complexity to it that it didn't need. It's hard to maintain that thing as weed free anyway. Uh, it's easier to just have it in the ground. Um, but yeah, you could do strawberries. You could also do like a, a primocane bearing, um, bearing raspberry, I imagine, in that space because those things get mowed down in the, uh, in, in the, in the spring anyway and fruit on their fall, you know, the, the, the primocanes that come up. I've not tried that. I, I just want something that popped into my head when you said you were excited about growing fruit in between. Um, as far as adding things in to attract beneficials, I know that um, sweet alyssum is common at, uh, in the warm season at being grown in like some empty spaces in the headland, like when you first get into a tunnel or right along the edges in the in some space to attract um like seerfin flies and other beneficials but um as far as winter i'm not i don't have much experience with with attracting them there's just not many places for them to come from in the winter as far as uh as far as i know and a sort of open question for me is like how Let's say you buy in beneficials. How well do they survive in the winter? And 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 are you just? Is it just a death sentence for them? Um, I, I I don't know. I I mean the ladybugs that they're bringing in from California are just hibernating in a in a in a log somewhere in the Sierra Nevada, and then they they gather them up and ship them to you. Um, so I guess they can tolerate the cold, but um, they're not super active. At least at, I don't. I don't know. It's a question I I still have yet to ask. I the the people who who provide these things. Um, Tom, was I uh, buying commercial compost? Yes, we were. Well, yes and no. We we tried to produce as much as you know. Yes, we produced our own compost that was based on vegetable scraps for our transplant media that we made ourselves. But we bought in commercial compost that was um, that was mostly leaf based from uh, like municipal leaf based from uh, from elsewhere from Ann Arbor. I missed one there. Yes, Susan, I will send that to you. Well, I will send it. To, we will send that to all of you. But um, was it Susan? What, Susan, were you the one who was growing uh, lettuce and peppers in the basement right now? You can unmute, of course, if you want, but. Uh, yeah, that's me. Okay. Um, so um, hopefully this opened some, you know, uh, idea, uh, you know, some prompted some ideas in your head, but like regarding your, your aphids situation in your basement, like maybe, maybe, and of course it's your basement and it's your house too, but maybe really some beneficials would, 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 would help in, in there like lace wings or um, something like that. Uh, there, there are there are predatory um, or parasitoid wasps that go after aphids as well um, that are tiny, but I mean they could be annoying and hovering around your laptop or phone screen, you know, in the in the night, <laughs> which which might be annoying, but it's something to think about because you know most a lot of these commercial greenhouses who are growing peppers and things like, and, and all sorts of things um, are getting away from spraying more and getting really big into these biocontrols. And because there's just so many secondary effects of spraying that cause another pest to population to explode, that they are, their, their main focus is biocontrol, releasing beneficial insects. Um, and then if it really gets bad and out of hand, then they reset by spraying something and then they get back into their biocontrol regime. So I don't know, something to think about. But so, but if yours is really bad right now, soap, uh, safer soap is a pretty effective uh, control of aphids if you can get it on all the surfaces that the aphids are on uh, and do it like a one-two punch, like three, day, three or four days apart, one spray and then another spray. And soap's pretty innocuous, um, but it, and effective against soft-bodied insects like aphids. 
Yeah, I thought about releasing some ladybugs, but then mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want them coming out the vents in my whole house. Oh, yeah. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. So I was kind of like afraid to, yep. you know, have them buzzing in my kids' rooms at night and whatever. Exactly. No, <laughs> so you don't no want sweat. that. And so then, so then I, what I did is I did like a soap spray, a little bit of just a tiny bit of soap with some garlic. Yes, you mentioned. And I mean, that. the Sorry. whole house, the whole house smelled like garlic, and everyone's complaining, but but it actually seemed to work. Good. And now I just occasionally squish one, and I seem to be sort of okay. Good. But Good. um, but I don't know. I, I, yeah, this is my first experiment with the winter growing, so maybe I ought to get a high tunnel. I don't know, maybe. but. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, high tunnels are nice, but um, now I'm curious, the, the peppers, are you actually getting peppers right now? Uh, yeah, we are. Nice. But, but this was a pepper that, uh, so we overwinter peppers in California. So right. for me, it's like, of course you have peppers in the winter, yeah. but um, I actually took these peppers and dug them up from the garden and brought them in. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Dan, do you have a good source for fruit culture, um, like Stark Brothers or does Johnny's do fruit? They do, um, but they're kind of expensive. Like you're talking about, um, so if you want small fruits, um, I would go with uh, somebody like Nurse, N-O-U-R-S-E out of Massachusetts. Um, there's a grower in Illinois that will sell um, plug strawberries, McNitt is their name, um, for trees. Gosh, I'm not an expert at this, but uh, I, I, I bought, um, there's some, there's a place out in uh, Washington called Burnt Ridge. They just sent a catalog to me yesterday that I got, I got some like hazelnut bushes from them last year for my, for my house. Um, I have gotten a tree from Stark, um, an Asian pear from Stark, but um, what's that place out in, um, another place in Washington, I think, or Oregon that's called like. I keep wanting to say Seven Springs, but that's like a spray company, not a, I can't remember the name of the place. I'm sorry. Uh, what was the place in the Midwest in Illinois you said? Oh, McNitt. They'll do like plugs of like strawberry plugs. Oh, right. Okay. Like that's where I grow. So I got Chandler strawberries from them, which I, which get planted in August um, here that then fruit immediately the, the next year. So they're grown in like an annual style. But I've, since then, I've, I've started propagating them myself, but um, I'm just playing with fire there. You know, you get too many generations in and then the disease catches up with you and you propagate it into the, your next one. And so um, it's best to, to buy them in every, every few years. Uh, oh, yeah. And somebody at, who's that about Papa Susan. Yeah. Papa's are are totally doable up here. Um, in fact, um, Patrick O'Malley is going to be speaking. It's like Patrick O'Malley is like my counterpart. He lives in Iowa City. He's uh, he does just the eastern side of the state uh, for supporting vegetable and fruit growers. Um, but he is a pawpaw fanatic, and he's doing a presentation about pawpaws and pears um, at the Iowa Specialty Producers Conference next week, next Thursday, or Wednesday. Well, next Wednesday, I think, is the day that he's presenting. Anyway even if you can't make it to that conference in Ankeny um, next Wednesday, he is, he, he, he's a wealth of information. And uh, in addition to him, Tom and Kathy at uh, Red Fern Farm, they are um, super knowledgeable about that. And they, they will sell, I, I believe they sell pawpaw trees that are well adapted to our, our climate. They're in Southeast Iowa, just, um, but for what it's worth. Brigham, did I answer all of your questions? You had, I feel like you had a specific need at the, or that you were asking for at the beginning of this. And I, I, I want to make sure I helped oh, you Oh, yeah, out. you did. Okay, good. Yeah, I got what I needed. Thanks. Okay, good. Danelle, I'm sorry, I don't have salt, much more solid aphid information. I think you were, you were, that was something I'd written down in my notes, like learn more about that. And I totally, I blew it. I'm sorry. 
I will keep I will I will keep in touch about that. Thanks, Lisa. And not hearing any other questions, I well, I, th I think we uh, I think we'll adjourn. Um, feel free, like, feel free to, uh, to to get in touch with me. It was up on the screen, but I'll just type it in right here. Uh, it, here's my phone number and my email address. Um, I am happy to to talk th about this stuff. Uh, almost at no end. This is, I, I, I am just so happy that I'm in this position right now and I get to talk about this. This is just a dream come true, dream job for me. So, and I, I love talking with y'all about these things and helping y'all out. You're very welcome. All right, thanks Dan. And thank you everybody for joining. I'll be following up with an email soon. All right, good night y'all. Take care. See ya.